So, um, speaking as a former fetus, um, I can tell you that uh, abortion is wrong uh, because I'm very grateful my mother didn't uh, kill me in the name of radical feminism. Um, also, um, 35 million women are missing uh, and will never celebrate Women's History Month because they were also slaughtered in the name of radical feminism. A third of my generation is missing because of legalized abortion. If you're Gen Z, a third or more of your generation is missing because they were killed in the womb. After the overturning of Roe versus Wade, states began to codify abortion into their state constitutions. You know what that means? So it's like, you know, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, and others basically say, woo! By the way, Kansas, Michigan, like Ohio, like states you might not have thought, said, we're going to codify abortion into our Michigan, Kansas, Ohio state constitution as a constitutional right. So that means all pro-life legislative efforts are DOA, uh, dead on arrival. They don't, I mean, they won't even get the time of day because, oh, that's in violation of the uh, Kansas state constitution. So that's the battlefield right now post the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Does that make sense? So in Texas, woo, abortion's illegal, except not really because they're shipping the abortion pill into your state. Do you understand? So brick and mortar surgical abortion facilities might not be operating in the state of Texas, but 63% of the abortions last year were the RU486 abortion pill. By the way, more babies were aborted in 2023, the first year since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, than had been killed at an annual rate in over a decade in America. Meaning higher, more babies killed in 2023 than were killed since 2012. Not put together, but at an annual reporting rate. So you overturn Roe v. Wade, and apparent, apparently Americans just got more bloodthirsty. So listen, I'm a California boy. Don't hold it against me, Texas. What I'm saying is, is I see all the garbage and junk ideas first <laughs> before it comes here. So I have authority to speak on this issue. Also, I might be a woman. I, I might have a uterus. And if you assumed otherwise, that's a dangerous thing to do in the age of Bruce Jenner. Um, so um, I might have women's rights to abortion as well. By the way, I actually, I do understand a lot of these ideas, especially transgenderism, because I too was a man trapped in a woman's body and then I was born. And so um, I understand how a lot of these um, ideas sort of... Um, overlap and coalesce, if you will. So, oh, also, by the time they're three months old, unborn babies begin to differentiate between male and female faces, and they prefer mother. So while elites might not be able to know what a woman is, babies do. Amen. Welcome to Vintage Church. My name's Seth Gruber. Um, Pastor Stephen uh, heard me speak at a conference in April. And it was a bunch of pastors and a bunch of believers. And I said that pastors in America need to go find where they bury their testicles in the backyard, reattach them, learn to be a man who stands against evil and preaches the full counsel of God and brings it into conflict with the demonic ideologies of the day. And I was, I'm going to tell you, I was a little bit afraid that Pastor Stephen would be like, I don't know if I want to bring you to Vintage. And said he texted me, he's like, I can't wait for you to come to Vintage. And I was like, oh, I like this guy. And I, I mean, I, I kind of wish I had his biceps, but, um, but I, love, I love Pastor Stephen. I love Vintage. It's, it's good to be with you guys. Um, so yeah, Texas, woo, don't mess with Texas. You know, one of the most pro-life states. And yet um, we're just killing babies in pro-life states that have banned abortion because of this RU486 abortion pill. Um, by the way, it's almost from the Nazis. Um, now, before you accuse me of being a conspiracy theorist, sensationalist, someone who listens to too much Alex Jones, although he's been right about a lot of stuff, um, the Roussel Ukloff is the French pharmaceutical company that created the abortion pill. So have you, have you heard of RU486? You, you might know it by medication abortion or abortion pill, but its technical name is RU, the, the letters, not like are you, you know, trans, and they're like RU486. Uh, it refers to Roussel Ukloff, RU, the French pharmaceutical company that created the abortion pill. Well, Roussel Ukloff has a majority shareholder named Hoekst AG. In 1916, 
I mean, my movie is called The 1916 Project. I don't know why it's everything, a lot of trash you can trace back to 1916. Come back tonight, you're going to have your face ripped off. You're going to blow away, holy spirit pill. You're going to become a son of Issachar, tearing down high places for King Jesus. But anyways, so in 1916, um, Hooks AG co-founded a German chemical company known as IG Farben, who years later created a cyanide gas known as Zyklon B. The gas used to poison Jews in Nazi death camps. So Hooks AG simply shifted from creating poison and murder Jews to creating poison and murder babies. It's the same company. Yeah, who heard that one before? Yeah, do you follow me on Instagram? <laughs> no. Oh, no, we got a smart guy here. Yeah, no, like what? How connected is all of this evil? Are you kidding me? 63% of the babies killed last year were not killed by vacuum catheter tubes or forceps. They were killed by RU486 abortion pills where the providers, whether they're shipping it to young women in the mail or it's you know, being given by a local abortion center, 63% of the babies killed last year were flushed down the American sewage system. So you need to understand that the abortion pill, those babies, their death does not get completed at the local abortion mill. The abortion industry tells, and we, we know this not only because we can literally read how this works, but because we speak to the women to whom this has happened. They're told to sit on the toilet, uh, don't look, and flush. So our sewers quite literally run red with the blood of our children, and then we wonder why we're under the judgment of God in America. Are you kidding me? God, rend the heavens, pour out your spirit on America. You tell us that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, and you will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Well, the land is desecrated with blood. You know, at the end of Psalm 106, um, God says, you've sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons. The land is desecrated with blood. And so I give you over to be ruled by those who hate you. That's like Psalm 106. Some, it's at the very end of Psalm 106. You sacrifice your babies to demons, so I'm done. Here, you can be ruled by pagan hordes who hate you. That's how God feels about this issue. And for Christians who say, well, the Bible's not pro-life. It doesn't say thou shalt not abort. I mean, I like, you know, I'm like the pro-life influencer weirdo homeschool kid on social media. So unfortunately, I get all the ridiculous arguments from the Unitarian Universalists, you know, or the Satanic Temple or the United Methodist Church. <laughs> By the way, you want to talk about one of the denominations in America that like ordains trans and homosexual gay married pastors? Like the United Methodist Church is a joke. I think there's like four congregations maybe left in America in that denomination that are faithful. So I get these arguments from these people all the time, right? Fake Christians who actually worship Baal but they sprinkle a little Christianese onto their paganism. And they say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion. What are you talking about? The entire Bible is a pro-life message. The savior of the world will enter human history as a uterus, in a uterus to redeem mankind from their sins and will identify with you from your most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage, allow himself to be killed for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So the greatest former fetus to have ever existed was named Jesus who's not fully God and fully human from the moment of birth, he's fully God and fully human from the moment of conception. Follow the science. Follow the science. Fauci. By the way, the people who scream follow the science at you the loudest in 2020, have you noticed this? That generally they believe men can be women, women can be men, babies aren't persons, and children are sexual beings. And I'm like, I don't think that's the science. Sometimes I feel like the, have you guys seen the princess bride? I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> This is inconceivable. <laughs> you know, it's like, I would like to ban that phrase, follow the science from American political discourse. <laughs> like, that's not what science is. Anyways, so then something incredible happened on June 24, 2022, something that we were told would never happen by our theological and political betters. And Roe versus Wade got sent into the ash heap of history. Amen. It was an incredible day, um, something we were told would never happen. By the way, I've been ripping Trump recently whenever he deserves it. I'm voting for him, but like he needs to shut up about like why we need to kill some babies to win elections. It's very frustrating. However, God sometimes uses pagan kings to accomplish for him what his own people won't do because they're weak, woke, cowardly, and wimpy. 
And so Roe versus Wade only got overturned because of all three Supreme Court appointments from that mean tweeting orange man that pious self-righteous Christians told you not to vote for if you were a good Christian. So apparently God chose to use mean tweets over Rick Warren winsomeness to begin overturning the high places of child sacrifice in June 24, 2022, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. This was an incredibly providential day, by the way. Um, did you know that Christians have a church calendar? Nope. Okay. So um, evangelicals suck at the church calendar. Um, give the Catholics a win when they deserve it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not Catholic, obviously, but like Catholics are a little bit better at the, like, do you know that we have like Christian festivals? There's Christian feasts that Christians used to celebrate. Most Christians today know more about LGBTQ, LMNP, IA, my name is Legion Month, and the various liturgical feasts of the religion of humanism every June, or whatever the new one is. I think there's like two months for transgenderism now. By the way, have you noticed that Black History Month, I've noticed that the culture never celebrates Christian conservative black people. It's so funny. Um, like they, I, I, it's like, why aren't we celebrating like Booker T. Washington? Like, it's so funny. It's only like radical pro-abortion leftist black people that they want to celebrate. So notice this about the left. They have these religious feasts, these months, these days they, se they set aside to celebrate basically anyone that agrees with them. Well, us Christians also have religious feasts and festivals. And one of them is the Nativity of St. John the Baptist that Christians celebrate every June 24th. So Roe v. Wade got overturned on the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. Do you want to know what it is? Thank you. Gee, I was like, did you guys not get your coffee? Or am I just like a weirdo? Like, I know I am, but like, come on. Okay, all right. The Nativity of St. John the Baptist is when Christians celebrate Mary going to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, the prenatal John the Baptist, little voice in the wilderness, little prenatal, little unborn fetus John the Baptist, starts doing backflips in the uterus because he recognizes the humanity and divinity of his prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, God-man, who once breathed out the Milky Way and entered human history in a uterus as a fetus, which is a Latin word for offspring or small child. So the next time someone tells you, it's not a baby, it's a fetus, you can say, you're right, it is an offspring and it is a small child. Good use of technical language, you leftists. And so he enters human history as a uterus and takes on fetal flesh to identify with us from our most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage. So while Mary and Elizabeth, two cousins, are hanging out, chilling, talking, blah, 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 the prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, God man is knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb because that is Christ in the womb and Christ is God and he is the second member of the Trinity because Jesus is not fully God and fully human from the moment of birth. That's anti-science. Jesus is fully God and fully human from the moment of conception. Follow the science. That's when every human being begins, including your savior. So you got the second member of the Trinity, prenatal deity, God man, who once breathed out the Milky Way, who's knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb while he's knitting himself together in the womb, while he's knitting himself together in the womb of a woman whose uterus he once knit together when he knit together Mary in the womb of Mary's mother. Papoon. It's called the incarnation. That's the arrival of the long prophesied and awaited God man who did not enter human history as a 30-year-old man. Your savior entered human history as a fetus. Amen. You don't mess with what's in the womb because your savior entered human history in a womb to redeem mankind from their sins. Of all the days that Roe v. Wade could have gotten overturned, wow, what a coinkadink. <laughs> it got overturned on the day in the church calendar when Christians celebrate two unborn babies, one of whom is God! Have you ever heard it said that providence is when God winks? Isn't that cool? Providence is when God winks. As if to say, I'm still here. <laughs> now fulfill your duty to your king. Oh, and then that evening on June 24, 2022, when the death sentence of preborn children was overturned and Roe v. Wade got sent into the ash heap of history, there was a planetary alignment in the night sky. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, and one other, all visible in the night sky to the stargazer by the naked eye. The last planetary alignment had been 20 years prior to that. Planetary alignments are pretty rare. Now listen, I'm not telling you, Christian, to go read the stars and decipher God's message, okay? Don't get into weird pagan stuff, okay? I'm not telling you to go read the stars. I'm just saying, that's kind of cool. A 20-year rare planetary alignment on the day that Roe v. Wade got overturned. And then this photo went viral, taken by an astrophotographer, so someone who takes pictures of space. And he captured all five planets in one picture. It was gorgeous. And I'm telling you, this photo went viral, like hundreds of millions of shares all around the world. Okay? The name of the astrophotographer who took the photo of a viral planetary alignment on uh, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist the day that Roe v. Wade got overturned, his name was Wright Dobbs. 
Two brothers. Thank you for saving my sermon. Uh, so the name of the Supreme Court decision, church, that overturned Roe versus Wade on June 24, 2022, that Supreme Court case is called Dobbs. It's spelled D-O-B-B-S, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And the last name of the photographer is Dobbs, D-O-B-B-S. I've never even met a Dobbs. I've certainly never met an astrophotographer. And the dude's name is spelled identical to the name of the Supreme Court decision that had overturned Roe v. Wade eight hours before that planetary alignment. And his first name's Wright, like Wright Dobbs. Dobbs Wright, Wright Dobbs. Wow. Chalk it up to another coinkadink. Or maybe God still intervenes in the affairs of men. What a providential time to be alive, church. And there was hardly a pulpit in America on the Sunday following the overturning of Roe versus Wade that gave glory to God for moving in the country and beginning, beginning to tear down some of the high places of child sacrifice in America. I'm here this morning to tell you, church, that we're not facing just another political issue. We're facing satanic spiritual warfare. You see, the culture war is just a proxy war for a far deeper spiritual war. Who has always been behind the killing of babies? Who's the dragon in Revelation waiting for Mary to give birth to the Christ child? Satan. Who's, who's behind the killing of babies by... Um, Pharaoh in Egypt and by Herod in Bethlehem. Satan. You see, Satan would kill God if he could, but he can't. So he kills babies because he knows it wounds the heart of the Father. Remember, church, Satan and demons, who used to be angels, are not getting saved. This is a really important point. Who created the angels? God. God. Are they rational? Yeah. Can angels speak? Yeah. But Christ's blood is not saving them. The third of the angels that defied are going to be in hell forever. It's only human beings that are given the opportunity for repentance and salvation. I think Satan hates that. I think he hates the fact that he knows he loses in the end. So in the meantime, what? Heartache, chaos, destroy the family. Target anything God loves and values. Because he can't kill God, but he knows he can, he can wound the, far of the heart of the father. He can cause him sorrow by targeting children and babies. You are a reminder that his days are numbered. And there will be a day when he's thrown into the lake of fire. So in the meantime, it's chaos, baby. The only thing that stands in his way? You. The blood-bought bride of Christ. Killing children and harming the family is Satan's standard operating procedure. And the church used to lead on the front lines of protecting children, babies, and the family. Did you know ex exposure, abortion, child sacrifice, and other forms of infanticide, more often than not, were both legal and respectable in pagan societies from the earliest times? In, in, uh, in ancient Rome, unwanted children were abandoned outside the city walls to die from exposure to the elements and from the attacks of wild foraging beasts. The Greeks often gave pregnant women heavy doses of herbal or medicinal abortifacients. The Persians developed highly sophisticated surgical curette procedures. Ancient Hindus and Arabs concocted chemical pessaries, uh, that is abortifacients, that were pushed or pumped directly into the womb through the birth canal. The primitive Canaanites threw their children onto great flaming pyres as a sacrifice to their god Moloch. The Polynesians subjected their pregnant women to onerous tortures, their abdomens beaten with heavy stones and hot coals heaped upon their bodies. The Egyptians disposed of their unwanted children, especially little girls, by disemboweling and dismembering them. And their collagen was then ritually harvested for the manufacture of cosmetic creams. The more things change, 
the more they stay the same. There are beauty creams you can buy in the West today that are made from aborted baby fetal tissue. So what, what was God's plan? Who was the institution that used to show up against that kind of wickedness? The church, you guys, like, do you understand? Like, I'm not calling you into pro-life activism. I'm calling you into Christianity. The pro-life movement used to go by another name. Christendom. This was, this was just a Christian thing. Did you know early Christians in the first century set up something called life watches because of how popular it was to abandon unwanted infants on trash heaps to be eaten by animals or die of starvation. And guess what Christians did when it was normal and acceptable to abandon infants? Christians set up life watches and they would position Christians a few meters outside of the perimeter of the trash heaps or the high places where they would abandon infants. And when a family would abandon their infant, a Christian who was on a life watch would come and rescue the child and raise them in the admonition and fear of the Lord. You wanna talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Okay, the early church was very racially diverse because they rescued abandoned infants that nobody wanted and raised them as their own. This is part of our faith. This is part of Christianity. And today we can't even get the church to establish enough spiritual clarity to vote and show up and bubble in a little circle that best represents your Christian worldview to defend the unborn. Did you know half of American Christians don't vote and the other half that, 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 do, that are registered, half of American Christians are not registered to vote and the other half that are registered to vote, half of them don't vote. So did you know evangelical Christians are the largest and simultaneously weakest voting block in the country? The largest voting block and the weakest voting block simultaneously. We won't even show up to vote. Your Christian civic duty against wickedness ought to begin with your vote, not end with your vote. Amen. We're in such a mess in this country that I don't think we can vote our way out of it. Now, I just told you voting's the beginning of your civic duty, so don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, remember the Obama years? I think they sucked. Guess what? The last four years, a lot worse. So what's my point? Even four years of Trump did not usher in this freedom and liberty that we used to remember in America because the culture is sick. We have a heart sickness problem in this country. Politics can withhold some wickedness. It can promote some righteousness, and it's a vital role for Americans and Christians to be involved in, but it's not the end-all solution. We're in such a mess. We need Christian resistance again in America, and that means doing a lot more than voting to give God a reason to show America mercy. None of what we're facing right now, church, is new. It's not a progressive revolution. It's a regressive revolution. So like the killing of babies, the endangering of women's rights, transgenderism, men in women's locker rooms and bathrooms competing against them in sports, the dude who beat the living pulp out of that woman in the boxing ring at the Olympics, are women's rights and spaces getting safer or more dangerous? What is one of the themes of basically every pagan society before Christendom and certainly before America? Babies and children, very dangerous. To be a woman, very dangerous. Like, we're just returning to neo-paganism, guys. We see this in the Bible, too. All of the insanity the church is facing, the culture is facing right now. It's all, it's all there if we would read our Bibles, if we had pastors like Pastor Stephen across this country who would raise up and equip the people to do the work of the ministry. So for a little theological clarity, because I'm starting to sound too much like a weird homeschool kid on a rant, let's go to the Bible. Um, in Judges 6, we see this guy named Gideon. Remember Gideon? Well, did you know he used to be a little pansy? So you can go from pansy to mighty man or woman of valor like that when you care more about pleasing Jesus than keeping your 501c3 status. Amen. So in Judges 6, before Gideon and the army and the 300 and God dwindling the army down, um, they're being oppressed by the Midianites. Basically, it's uh, Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism. Like AOC loves it. Um, 
It's democratic socialism. I've been told that's much better than regular socialism. It's something like icing on a turd or like um, if you vote your way in, you have to shoot your way out. It's something like that. But so in Judges 6, if you read it, you'll notice that the Israelites produce things like wheat and the Midianites just come and steal it. So you make, we take. Great definition for socialism. That's a freebie for you, church. You make, we take. And so God has given his people over to be ruled by pagan hordes who hate them. And in Judges 6, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon because he's hiding up in a mountain cave or a wine press up in the foothills because he says, I'm going to make my own wheat and keep it to myself while I let my Israelites get robbed in broad daylight down in the valley. So basically, pansy. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and he says, mighty man of valor. But he wasn't. (laughs) But he reminds him of his identity, who he is and what God is calling him to. He cooks God a meal. God lights it on fire. Gideon kind of freaks out, has a very Job humbled moment. And then it says, and that same night, the angel of the Lord told Gideon, you walk out of this cave and go tear down the altars to Baal. And those Asherah poles over there on the other side of the camp, I want you to chop them up. And then I want you to take the destructed um, wood of the pagan demon gods and light it on fire as a sacrifice. I really like the scent of burning pagan demons whose idols you've destroyed. That's very pleasing to me, says the Lord. Now, I'm embellishing a little bit, but that's what God says to do. Okay? I'm like, wow, that's not the Christianity I read about in Christianity yesterday. Uh, Christianity today. Um, and the Gospel Coalition, wow, that's, a, hmm, that's not very nice, not very winsome. Gideon, you're harming your Christian witness uh, to the Midianite hordes And if you really cared about the salvation of souls in the Great Commission, you wouldn't get so political, uh, and you would just try to get people saved but not preach against evil. It's like like when David's holding the head of Goliath. You know what happened right then? Uh, Tim Keller, uh, Stephen Furtick, uh, Andy Stanley uh, walked up, and they said, "Um, David, you're really harming your Christian witness. The Philistines are really hurting and demoralized right now. And you flaunting God's victory over the Philistines, it's harming your Christian witness. Now go lay your hands on the Philistine brethren and pray for them. Weep with those who weep, David, and mourn with those who mourn. And all David does is hold up the head of Goliath and gives gives glory to God. The overturning of Roe versus Wade was the closest thing we had to the head of Goliath in the American culture war in our entire lifetime. And rather than celebrating, most American pastors and Christians began to apologize for the overturning of Roe versus Wade because of other Christians who, who were so used to orgasms without responsibility, they liked their Asherah poles and their Baal statues. As it was in Judges 6, so it is today, church. The two pagan gods in Judges 6, Asherah, goddess of sex. By the way, do you know how they worshiped Asherah? Orgies, temple prostitutes. It's all in the Old Testament. What happens when you live like that? Not a trick question. Get super elementary school with me right now. What happens when you live crazy sexual Asherah poles like? Babies. Babies. <gasps> you mean when you have sex? That, that's, a, that's where ch- like humans come from? <gasps> so today, Planned Parenthood is not only the largest abortion provider in the world, they're also the largest provider of that pornographic, obscene sexuality education in the public schools? Who's seen it? Oh yeah, it's, it's in Dallas-Fort Worth for sure. What's that guy's name, Clay Jenkins? In Dallas-Fort Worth, he refuses to prosecute child sex crimes. A lot of these people have been bought and sold by the sex ed lobby. So for Planned Parenthood, sex ed is their sales funnel, abortion is their product, and your children are their prospects. What I'm telling you, church, is that Baal and Asherah always go together. So sexual chaos, defying God. I'm not going to do it your way, God. I'm not going to wait for marriage. I'm not going to have it the way that pleases you. I'm going to do whatever I want. Sexual chaos and baby killing, those two sins have been linked since time immemorial. They always go together. So Baal and Asherah are two different sides of the same child commodifying coin. Augustine, in his book, City of God, has a phrase that has really come to encompass how the left operates in the culture and targets your children. The phrase is libido dominandi. Yeah, think about the phrase for a second. Libido 
dominandi. It means sexual liberation as political control. So what does that mean? If we can incite the next generation into a sexual frenzy, whatever feels good, do it. Don't wait. Don't do it God's way. Don't wait for marriage. Only fans. Pornography. Do you know what the average age is in this generation to exposure to pornography? It's eight years old now. Some of us, before our days walking with Jesus, had to find it in our uncle's closet. Today, we give our children pornography for Christmas, and it's called a smartphone. And then you wonder why abortion is at higher numbers right now than it's ever been in America, at least since 73. We failed to recognize as the church that you can't just deal with one aspect of the culture of death. It all goes together. Satan doesn't want one school board or one county or one district. He wants presidents, kings, and countries. That's a global agenda. It's the Great Commission flipped upside down. They have taken our strategy of discipling the next generation, right? What's the Great Commission? Preach the gospel, baptize in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's what they've done for wickedness. Teaching young people how to live however they want. The Asherah poles and the Baal statues are back, church. As it was in Judges 6, so it is today. But we don't have the spirit of Gideon in the American church, do we? Like, I need you to understand, more babies were killed last year in America, over a million children in 2023. And those were only the ones that got, like, registered. Because of that Nazi-era abortion pill, understand me, many of those abortions are not being categorized or captured in the reporting numbers. So if I were to guess and I think I have a pretty educated guess on this, I would guess it was closer to 1.5 million babies killed last year in 2023. We don't have the spirit of Gideon. We like our comfortable sermons. We like our cush lifestyle. We like the freedoms and liberties that are a little more secure in Texas. But that revolution that has wiped out the unborn has redefined marriage, has redefined gender now, apparently, will one day redefine you in its own image as well. The enemy of our souls will tolerate no opposition. Let me give you a biblical example for this, shall we? We like the Bible here? By the way, y'all okay right now? Yeah. Okay. We have the spirit of Lot in the American church. I believe I was supposed to tell you this this morning. Two archetypes for how the church can engage the culture. Which way, Christian man? Which way, Christian woman? Gideon or Lot? Remember Lot? He was the Christian influencer of his day. He stood at the gates of Austin, uh, of Sodom, when the angels came to torch that city. And if you know anything of the politics of that era, you'll understand that a man who was positioned at the city gates would have been a politically significant, culturally formative, respected individual. And the angels come to towards that city, and what does Lot do? He says he takes them to his home, and then it says men from all parts of the city of Sodom came rushing to Lot's front door. Does that feel like America in 2024? Every part of the culture of death coming to the house of the living God to those who are part of the remnant. Hey, Lot in there. But don't worry, he's a righteous man, remember. Because we're saved by faith, right? Not by works. But what kind of man was Lot? Hey, Lot, bring those men out into the public square because we want to have sex with them outside here. I'm sorry, do you understand that's the Old Testament? This is why uh, Angel Studios and The Chosen won't be making the Old Testament version anytime soon. I'm pretty sure that would be like Game, Game of Thrones-ish. I don't think Christians could watch that. 
And Lot walks out onto his front porch. Brothers and sisters. Do you know that's what he says? Some versions say, my dear friends. I'm sorry, do you generally refer to people that want to have the rape angels in the public square as your brothers and your sisters? I generally don't refer to people that want to have sex with angels in the public square as my brothers and my sisters. I'm not calling to be nasty or rude to the unrepentant and the wicked, for such were some of us. But if you can no longer differentiate anymore between who is your brother and who is your sister, then how will you know to whom to preach this gospel of salvation in the first place? Lot has been so affected by the culture of Sodom, it's crept in to his heart. So much so that he would call people that want to rape angels, his brothers and his sisters. They're not your brothers and sisters, Lot. Stop trying to get crumbs from the table of secular humanism and attaboys from the Biden administration so you can keep your 501c3 status and be invited to all those fun parties. Right? You don't like my tone right now. It's not very winsome or kind of me. So let's give Lot a little grace. What's the next thing Lot says? If you go read, this is your homework to go read the story from Sodom. He says, don't do this wicked or abominable thing. These people want to rape angels, okay? Do you understand why God torched that city? And Lot says, don't, don't do this. He calls their actions wicked. He was willing to label the actions and the agenda of the culture of, of death revolutionaries wicked. But church, we have a lot of Christian influencers, music artists, pastors, authors, and podcasters who are sometimes willing to criticize and critique evil. They're sometimes willing to label the actions of the demoniacs in our culture wicked and evil, but not enough to be a threat. Like Lot, they'll only preach as much truth as the spirit of the age allows them to. How can I prove that biblically? Because the very next words out of Lot's mouth are here. Take my daughters. Have sex with them instead. That's in the Bible. The testing point of every man and father is his ability and his willingness to protect his own. And you know what? Actually, any vulnerable or voiceless individual who can't stand for themselves. When the culture of death came to the front door of the righteous, he's called, Lot is called righteous. Rather than be a bulwark to evil and stand up, Lot gives over the next generation and his own posterity on a silver platter to the culture of death and says, have your way with them. Lot was saved, but he was not salty. So his wife becomes in death what he should have been in life. A pillar of salt. What does salt do, church? It's supposed to preserve and conserve something. I'm here this morning to tell you that I think the message of the Bible is overwhelmingly clear on this topic, that those that God wants to preserve and conserve the most are the voiceless, the young, the vulnerable, and the targeted. As they're fleeing that city, Lot's wife looks back. I'm gonna miss those parties. Sodom was so fun. Men in the room this morning, I'm going to tell you that if your wife prefers running back to Sodom than joining you to go build the kingdom of God where your father is calling you, you have failed her as a husband. Why does it always have to do with the family? The young and the children, every time. Why? Because Satan knows his days are numbered. But you are image bearers of God. 
So he will target and destroy and corrupt and sexualize and murder, for he is a lion prowling around looking for those to devour. But when the church stands up, Satan sits down. Stop waiting for God to work miracles in this country if you're not willing to give him a reason to. We are the church of the living God. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit, but we are fat and lazy, and we are far too comfortable in the American church. So church, Gideon or Lot, who do you want to be? Listen, Lot's a righteous man. That's what the Bible says. Do you know what that means? It means we're going to see him in glory. But what is Lot's testimony going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb? If I may for one minute think about this. If I could guess, Lot will say, I gave my daughters to be raped by a mob and God forgave me. By grace and grace alone. Remember, Lot goes on to have sex with his own daughter's church. By grace and grace alone. Okay. That's a testimony. What's going to be your testimony at the marriage supper of the Lamb? When you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I believe because of how long I've been fighting these evils, I believe because of how much these things anger our Father, I now believe in my heart, I can't prove this biblically, I believe we'll be asked, what did you do? As they wiped out the unborn, as they sexualized children, as they targeted the innocent and the voiceless, what did you do in that generation? At the White Rose Resistance, my organization, we're now the fastest growing pro-life organization in America. I founded it so that you could give an answer to that question one day. We're trying to put ourselves out of a job by reawakening the blood-bought bride of Christ in America to do what she should have been doing all along. I think we have too many 501c3 organizations in America. I'm going to say it as the CEO of one. Because I think organizations like mine they're doing good work that the local church used to do as an overflow of their salvation, their redemption, and their love for Jesus. I'm 33 years old. In 10 years, I don't want to be tearing down another high place. I want to be rebuilding Christendom with Vintage Church. And every church in America that cares more about pleasing Jesus and standing against evil. So, this is your moment. This is our moment. Regardless of what happens in a month, regardless of what happens in the election, we need the church to awaken and retake her place on the wall. Listen, we win in the end. But that's not the point. The point is, how are you going to be faithful to what God has given you in this wicked generation in which you're called to shine like stars? So we're launching White Rose Resistance chapters around America. We're playing the film in hundreds of churches. We're teaching the church what Christian resistance looks like. If that's something you're interested in, I'll ask you for two things. I'll ask you to come back tonight to watch a movie that's going to rip your face off and awaken you to the evil history behind this agenda to teach you that this is all spiritual. And secondly, I'll ask you to consider joining the White Rose Resistance. So um, we need your help. Um, we can't do this. In 10 years, I hope to put the ministry out of business and walk away because the local churches in America are so fired up for righteousness where they live that my organization becomes a moot point. In the meantime, we have a big vision in front of us. If you want to be a part of that, you can text White Rose to 50155 or scan this QR code. If you join at $35 a month, you get a battle box in the mail in the next month so you can be a pro-life ninja and a Gideon tearing down high places. And you get a free shirt and a hug from me when you leave. Um, oh, yeah. And then um, if you join at $70 a month, you actually get my book for free. 
the 1916 Project, you get the battle box in the mail, you get a free shirt, and you join our book club. And we read books together, and we talk about them live on Zoom, and sometimes the author shows up. But we do a lot to pour into you because the church is a solution to all of this insanity. Anyways, I'm just a weird homeschool kid trying to toot my horn and wake people up. So I come back at six to get a seat. And in the meantime, will you go out there and give them heaven for me?